Well, amen, how exciting it is for us to gather together for worship this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter one. Acts chapter one. We're gonna continue our walk through the book of Acts this morning. We'll be looking, beginning in verse three through 12 of Acts chapter one. If you do not have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that, make it your own as a gift from us to you. There's something I want to show you before we read our passage in Acts. So you hold your spot there in Acts chapter 1. But there's something I want to show you about uh, th- that, that gives the mindset for the disciples so that you, you can know they are not off their rockers uh, in, this, in this section that I'm about to read in Acts chapter 1. You see, it's the night of Jesus' betrayal. They are in the upper room. And Jesus is giving them their final instructions. John tells us and and focuses on Jesus washing his disciples' feet. But Luke has a different focus. He begins to detail for us a conversation that night that where Jesus would tell his disciples out of Luke 22, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So after the shock of Jesus' death and resurrection, now over a period of, of 40 days as Jesus has been appearing to them, they begin to get their wits about them. It is understandable how the disciples at this point in our passage would say to Jesus, are you now becoming the king of Israel? Like many Old Testament passages, like Ezekiel 39, detailed the coming of the Messiah, the outpouring of the Spirit, and the restoration of Israel. You see, they are not cotton-headed ninny-muggins. There is no way for them to see, with our hindsight 2020 vision, that there will be a gap. See, Jesus' kingdom is here, And he is going to reign, but it's on his heavenly throne. And one day that heavenly throne will meet the earthly throne, and the two will become one. But there is a gap, and that gap is where we live. Do you know why there's a gap? Why Jesus didn't immediately begin to judge the living and the dead like he promised his disciples and make all things right, but instead ascended into heaven to be enthroned at the right hand of the Father. That's what we're going to be looking at today. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. I'll read 3 through 12. To these, that is, his apostles. He also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of things concerning the kingdom of God. And then gathering them together, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for what the Father has promised, which he said you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, listen, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs for which the the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, he was going 
Behold, two men who were in white clothing stood beside them and they and also said to them, men, to, men of Galilee, why are you standing looking into the sky? This Jesus, whom you have seen taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. And then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called All That, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we pause right now to, to just focus our mind and our attention on you. As we have just read in your word, your son is enthroned in heaven, ruling and reigning. And, and, and there is a gap between when you are coming to reign on your earthly throne and you have called us in that interim to be your witnesses. Father, would your word give us our marching orders and give us instruction and would you charge us this morning through the power of your spirit, God, because we want to walk worthy of you. We want to know you. We have sung your praises. You inhabit the praises of your people. And now we beg for your spirit to teach us all the more the power that is available to us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Patrick Schreiner has an incredible illustration that I want to share with you. And it helps that it's out of one of my favorite Disney movies, The Lion King. All right, there are many Christian themes in The Lion King. See, the story opens with Simba being branded as the heir to the throne, as Rafiki holds him up at his birth in declaration, this is the heir, and all the animals bow down to the future king. The entire story, the rest of it, will all be the journey about the exile and the homecoming for Simba to get his rightful place back atop Pride Rock. And there will be a battle for that throne, which has been seized by his evil uncle Scar. And the battle is fierce and strong, but Simba will overcome and he conquers Scar and all those repulsive hyenas. I mean, we hate hyenas. It's the perfect evil enemy. But this isn't the end. Because even though he's been designated and appointed and even conquered the forces of darkness, you see, there's an often overlooked final step. The camera focuses on Rafiki because the story has come full circle. And Rafiki, with his staff, points Simba back to Pride Rock where the king must take his rightful place. And so dramatically, he ascends the mount and roars because the king is enthroned. In a better way, Jesus was declared the long-awaited king, son of David, from the beginning of the Gospels. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? At his baptism, the father announces from heaven his son with a voice from heaven. And Jesus declares the kingdom of heaven has come repeatedly again by his healing and his miracles, all attesting to his kingship. In fact, causing those who are in power to protest, by what authority do you teach this way? And in his most dramatic passion scene, he is presented as king. He is mocked as king. And ironically, he is even declared to be king with a sign above his head that reads, here is king of the Jews. But death could not hold the king. See, it was impossible for him to be held by its power. He defeated death, he overcame Satan, and he made a way for sinners like you and me to be forgiven, to be made right before a holy God, that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But just like Simba, there is one final crucial step. 
The king must be enthroned. He must be recognized as king. See, we often make so little of Jesus' ascension account here in Luke, mainly because it's from the earthly perspective. But where is the resurrected Lord? Oh, he rode on the clouds into heaven. You see, but you must understand that Luke's account is drawing on one of the most important passages in the whole Bible. Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, it's a scene of, of gnarly, fierce beasts who represent abusive kings of the earth. But there stands one in complete contrast, a son of man. Listen to Daniel 7, 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. That's God the Father. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair on his head was like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were like burning fire. Verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days, and he was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the people's nations and men from every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. You see, even though Luke gives us the earthly perspective, Daniel 9's reference forces you to think about the king enthroned in heaven. Revelation chapter 12 actually gives us a magnificent picture of Christ entering into heaven and Satan being cast out of heaven. Colossians chapter 2 calls it a public procession. It's the words used in the Roman Empire for when one king had conquered another. And in this parade, after you defeated your enemies, your enemies are chained and you would take the king and you would place him up front followed by all of those enslaved behind him, and you would march back into your cities in this public parade, this procession, signifying that the king had defeated all other kings, that there is one king. That's what Colossians chapter 2 begins to unfold for us. Psalm 110 tells us that when the Son got to heaven, that the Father said to the Son, well done, Take your seat. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool underneath you. And Psalm chapter 2 declares that the Father promised the Son the nations as his inheritance. The ends of the earth as his possession. Guys, this is no insignificant event. As Simba walks to the edge of Pride Rock and roars at his enthronement, Jesus took his seat in heaven and all of the heavens roared because the king had come back to his rightful throne. <laughs> Philippians 2, for this reason, God ought highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, the ascension, I told you last week that in the book of Acts, it is the hinge for so many incredible theological pivots from Old Testament to New Testament that the king had, 
had come to the earth, but he ascended back to his rightful throne. It is out of that enthronement that you are supposed to read the rest of the book of Acts and that you are supposed to read the thesis statement for the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. See, he's going to give his final instructions to his disciples and to us. And what is he going to say to them? Wait in Jerusalem for the promised Holy Spirit, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. The gospel will go forward. So that's what we're going to walk through this morning. Real quick, instructions that are given to the disciples, but also given to us, that because Jesus is king, because he is enthroned, first we see that Jesus calling us to be his witnesses. You see, the disciples are ready to rule and to judge. They're ready to be on top. But Jesus says, not yet. There is a gap, right? Before my heavenly reign and my earthly reign become one. And in that gap, you and I and the disciples are called to be his witnesses. There are two things that are at the heart of being a witness for Jesus. Number one, simply to be changed by him. And then to call others to that same hope. Guys, that's what we're going to see all through the book of Acts, that the disciples have been radically changed by Jesus. And so too, those who have heard and believed in the apostles' teaching, right? They're going to be filled with joy and peace and boldness to overcome and love for one another. We're going to hear the, the statement over and over again, and they were recognized as having been with Jesus. A witness changed by him and one who calls others to that same hope. Hey, you want to grab lunch tomorrow? I just want to check on you. See how I can pray for you. Church, 2,000 years later, we have that same calling. The calling to be a witness and we're going to come back together here in a moment and piece this back together. But let me point out, while we're here, it is not enough to simply be changed by him. Right? Jesus didn't say to his disciples, you guys are good. Go build a holy huddle off in the corner and just live a peaceful life. A witness must call others to the same hope. But in calling them to be a witness, he gave very important instructions. What did he tell them? Wait in Jerusalem for your power source. Why? Because you are a dependent witness. Dependent on power that comes from the Holy Spirit. Be a witness, but wait for the power of the Spirit. Guys, this is equally important. You have to understand, all the information is available for them to be a witness, right? They've seen the resurrected Lord. Okay? They've seen him. They can walk around and tell other people that. In fact, Jesus has instructed them how to read their Old Testament. He showed them, I'm going to suffer. See, it says that right here. I'm going to be resurrected. See, it says that here. He's taught them all of those things. All the ingredients for all the sermons that they are going to preach are already there. And yet he says, wait. You are a dependent witness. Wait for the promise. Do you remember in John 14 through 16? Jesus said, I have to go to the Father. And when I do, when I am enthroned, when I sit on my throne, he will send the helper. And at the end of Luke, he says, and you will be clothed in power. 
Church family, we've been on a journey since Easter, studying the Holy Spirit and his power, his work in us and through us, right? The Holy Spirit inside of you is better than Jesus beside you. But right here in this passage, in Acts 1-8, there is a special emphasis given to the Holy Spirit that the Spirit is empowering you to be a witness to that finished aim. Yes, to change you, to restore you, to heal your brokenness, to give life to your marriage and your home, but to the end that you would be a witness and power to be a witness. Evidence that Jesus is on his throne is that you and I are empowered to be a witness. What we'll see all through the book of Acts is that there's a need for a continual filling of the Spirit in order to walk out in that power. Right? To paraphrase John 15, Jesus says, listen, abide in me and I in you, because apart from me, you can do nothing. Right? You will not produce fruit. But if you abide in me, my Father will be glorified because you will bear much fruit. You will prove to be my disciples. You will be a witness for me. Okay, we're called to be a witness. We're called to wait for that power. And then the third piece, as you piece this together, you realize is that there is a call to mobilize. That is to organize and to go with intention. He says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. You see this expanding circles of influence. But church, you also must realize this will happen because he reigns. The gates of hell will not prevail because he reigns. He is worthy and the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. Psalm 2 already promised And Revelation chapter 7 has a picture of the final scene that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, will go to the ends of the earth as proof that Jesus Christ is reigning in heaven right now. It cannot be stopped. It will not be stopped. And so we collectively are called to mobilize, to be a powerful witness. Now let's talk about this for a second because some of us are called to go individually. Some of us are called to stay here and support. And all of us are called to pray. But we collectively are called to mobilize, to organize, to go, to figure out how you're gifted and I'm gifted and how we work together, that we're one body so that we can go, so that we can shine the light of the good news of Jesus here in Bernie and to the ends of the earth. Now, here's what I mean by this charge to mobilize. Those who have the gospel must reach out to those who do not have the gospel. It's why the older generation is always called to reach the younger generation and will lay down preferences to say, you know what? I will lay down my rights in order to reach the generation that does not yet have the gospel. It's not enough to sit around and to make social commentary about how bad the world is. We have the gospel. We must do whatever it takes to reach out. And secondly, entwined in this is is we must be active. you got to be intentional about this. There's no way to read this section and think Jesus wants me to keep my faith to myself. The early church is going to meet in the temple courtyard. Think about that. 
in the temple courtyard. That's where they choose to meet every morning? Yes. Obviously, that stirs up controversy. They're going to get arrested. They're going to get beaten. They're going to get thrown in prison. An angel is going to come, let them out of prison and declare to them, go right back to the temple because the people need to hear the message of life. Amen. So in summary, because Jesus is enthroned, church, do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is on his throne? Then he gives his disciples and us, his church, marching orders as evidence of his kingship. You and I, those who have been born again, who have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit wants to empower us to be his witnesses. Those who have been changed by him and call others to that same hope. But this is our calling as individuals and as a church. This is our mission. So real simply, let's ask the question. In your circle of influence, at work, school, neighborhood, family, friends, are you a witness? That is, are you reaching out? Guys, there are many ways to reach out. You don't have to stand up and, and preach a sermon. I, I doubt if you did that in your front yard, many people would listen. Okay? It, it doesn't have to be any harder than, than building a relationship and, and asking, how can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? And then you're intentional about it. Are you reaching out with the hope of the gospel? I asked a question at the beginning. Why is there a gap? Let me ask that another way. Is heaven better than your life right now? Well, yes, of course. All right, good. Then why did Jesus leave us here? I mean, I was saved at the age of 15. Why didn't Jesus take me then? Why didn't he take you the moment you were saved? Why didn't he take the apostles with him as he ascended to heaven? To save others. To be a witness. He patiently withheld judgment so that I could be saved so that I could hear the good news, so that I could know him. That is why he patiently waits. Eric moved to Plainview to be close to his grandfather and to get a fresh start in life. The first time we sat down for lunch, he was so ashamed that he would barely make eye contact with me. He kept looking off to the side as I just began to get to know him and hear his story. But as we began to develop a relationship, a few lunches in, he would begin to tell me some of his shameful past, filled with fraud and embezzlement, all the things that were his deepest, darkest secrets. I simply began by asking him if I could pray for that fresh start. Would it be okay if I just prayed that God would give you a fresh start here in Plainview? And then a few weeks later, I had the awesome privilege of leading him to faith, place his faith in Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. Tragically, about four months later, Eric was in a fatal accident. But I know one day I'm gonna see him again. And oh, we will rejoice over those lunches. Our calling as a church, not you as an individual, 
Yes, you as an individual, but collectively, we also have the same charge. We are called to be witnesses, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to be mobilized, intentional as we go, figuring out how you're gifted, how I'm gifted, how we work together, and what God is calling us to do together. Guys, we are to cry out to a self-reliant culture. Come find life. Come find healing for your soul. Come find true riches in Christ Jesus. He is better. He is better. He has changed me, and he can change you. And we are called to do this with great intentionality. And we're not perfect It's always a work in progress. We're trying to get better. But a church must reach out to its community. Meet them where they are so that you can earn the right to share the gospel. Right here in Bernie, we have local mission partners that we are inviting, encouraging you all the time to get plugged in with. If it's the pregnancy center, if it's Meadowlands, if it's we're going to have a serve day this fall, FBC Loves Bernie, where we reach out just to be the hands and feet of Christ. We also have local mission partners in San Antonio taking it to the streets and moment of truth, all of which provide regular service opportunities for you to get plugged in. And calling us to go on mission trips. We have international mission trips, mission partners, guys, around the world, Moldova, Yucatan, Uganda, that we went to this summer. When I came back from Uganda, so many of you tapped me on the shoulder and you said, there's just such an excitement when you got back. I love to hear the stories, the excitement. And all I can say is, guys, can you believe that we are the ones who get to go? Can you believe that? Like we have the good news and the resources and we are structured as a church that we get to go. And you can do that locally, right? Like we get to reach out. We get to pray to our heavenly father. We get to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We get to think and strategize and come up with new ideas to reach out, to create new ways to reach out with the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to go into spaces where our community desperately needs it. Like last night, we... Me and my wife, we we were up here and we were serving with foster parents night out. Just as a church, playing in that space where we're reaching out, where we're earning the right to share the good news of Jesus Christ, that we get to do that. So this fall, we've been asking you to find your sweet spot. And every announcement, we call attention to the card and the pew rack, and there's a spot for you to serve if you're interested in these areas. Right, so you can, you can run a camera on Sunday morning. You can help in side-by-side our special needs ministry. You can go to Hope for Heroes on Saturday. There are so many ways for you to get plugged in. And you say, Pastor, chill out. Why are you so wound up this morning? Because this is our calling. This is our purpose. This is why he left us here. He is enthroned, and he has left us here to be his witnesses. And with everything in me, I cry out, get in the game. Get in the game. I want you to have the purpose and fulfillment that I have. And I don't just mean because I'm the pastor and I preach on Sunday mornings. I just mean... My whole life, I've been on this quest to find meaning, to find hope, and I've found it in Jesus Christ. And he's he's given me his spirit, and he's given me certain giftings, and to use those and to see people's lives changed for the kingdom, for eternity, there's nothing greater. This past week, we had a, a, a couple stop by our house they were, uh, we hadn't seen them in some time. They were uh, a part of ministry way back in the day. And it, 
That ministry way back in the day was actually really tough ministry. It was like ministry where you're like, I'm just putting one foot in front of the other, trying to be faithful. It doesn't seem like God's doing much of anything. We hadn't seen them in almost 10 years it was their 10-year anniversary. I, I performed the wedding, and, and they, took the, they were doing their anniversary in Fredericksburg, and they, they drove all the way to have dinner with us and drive back, and we were like, you guys are crazy. You're taking so much of your anniversary time to, to spend with us. And as the evening went on, like we reminisced about good times and all those things, but it, it was very apparent that they wanted to say something to us, and And when they did, they simply wanted to say, we cannot express how much the Lord has used you in our lives. Even though it's been some time, you impacted us. I couldn't go to sleep that night because I was filled with joy. Because I remember how hard that season of ministry was We didn't think like God was going to use it or do anything with it. But just to know that through the power of the Spirit, He accomplishes, He is faithful. I hear you. It's because it gets in my beard. I apologize for that. (laughs) But just to know that He is faithful, that nothing is ever wasted, and that your life can count for eternity. I just want you to know that hope. I want you to know that purpose. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, right now I pray all across this room and as we've been charging your people this fall to to find their spot where they can serve, where they can be used by you. And as we read this text and its magnificence in terms of King Jesus, that you are on the throne. And and you are empowering us through your spirit so that we can be your witnesses, so that you want to use us Jesus, would you help us to realize that, to genuinely believe it, to find our spot where your spirit works through us, where we come to the end of our days and we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. It's genuinely the longing of our hearts It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.